The decision by the High Court in Pretoria to declare former South African Airways Board Chair Dudu Mieni a delinquent director for life brings up questions about the commitment of the government to good governance in state-owned enterprises. Handing down her final decision on Wednesday, Judge Renel Tolme said Mieni was a director gone rogue with no consideration for her fiduciary duty to SAA. Tome also cautioned that to serve on a board of an SOE should not be a privilege of the politically connected. Recently, courts have either delivered scathing judgments or managed to overturn decisions made by executives in state-owned entities or public officials. Some of these examples are the court decision against Parliament involving former President Jacob Zuma on the Nkandla matter, cases against former ministers Malusi Gigaba and Batibile Dlamini, and former ESCOM CEO Brian Molefe, among others. Dr Mbongaseni Butelezi is the uh, executive director of the Public Affairs Research Institute. He joins us now via Skype to unpack this decision and some other issues. Great to have you. I, I beg your pardon, it's via Zoom, not Skype. Good to have you, Dr. Butelezi. Thanks for being with us. Certainly. Good morning, Leanne. Good morning to your viewers. There aren't many case references on court decisions about errant directors in South Africa, but there were views that if the court were to find Mnyeni a delinquent director, she would be barred for five or seven years. The court, however, declared her delinquent director for life. Does the judgment express the severity of her conduct as a director? I think it does, um, but more than that, I think... Um, it, it, it's the severity of um, the actions of people who hold public office and their implications, I think, for the lives um, of South Africans, for the state, for the fiscus um, that are important here. The, the, the conduct, according to the judgment, um, was found to be quite severe. Um, I mean, the term rogue, yeah, as you've quoted, was used. But I think, I think what's important, I think, uh, for us going forward is how public officials, people who are entrusted with the responsibility of looking after public money, taxpayers' money, um, need to look after that money, need to take that responsibility seriously and need to dispense that responsibility in ways that um, protect the public interest. Mm. So Mnyeni was appointed as a, a non-executive director of the board of SAA in September 2009, then became acting chair in December 2012, and then chair in 2016 until 2017. Allegations of wrongdoing against Mnyeni have been a point of contention for a very long time. Why did it take civil society going to court and not government for action actually to be taken? I think we should remember that um, public institutions um, like the National Prosecuting Authority, like the Hawks, have themselves been subject to the phenomenon um, that has been called state capture in South Africa. And so their capacity uh, to do the right thing, to do their work without fear or favor, has been severely compromised. Um, the political class um, in South Africa um, has played a, an extensive role in directing um, what those institutions do in the previous uh, era. Um, and so that's why it took civil society, and this I think is a reminder also of the role that civil society plays, which is even though institutions of the state that are charged with the duty uh, to investigate, to prosecute people um, for wrongdoing, um, especially in this case regarding public money, um, if they don't do that, jo that job, uh, there's still civil society. There are still people who are looking out for the public interest that will step in. And there are mechanisms for accountability that still hold in our society. Yeah. What we, we see, of course, is that there is a need to rebuild uh, state institutions. That uh, process has been talked about over and over again. But it, it, takes, it takes a long time also. Uh, to, to get accountability through the courts. And people can uh, duck and dive. People can challenge uh, aspects of the applications that are before the courts. And this is what we've seen uh, in this particular case. Do you think now that the National Prosecuting Authority um, will take action as this case has actually been referred to them now? The NPA, I mean, we, uh, we know from the judgment uh, that the judge um, has said the matter will be referred to the NPA. But um, one of the applicants in the matter, uh, Outer, uh, has also said that they themselves will refer the matter to the NPA. 
the NPA follows its own processes, and those processes um, can ad- cannot be dictated uh, by a judge or by a judgment. So the NPA will have to follow its own processes uh, to to determine whether there's action to be taken, whether there's an investigation that needs to be launched here, uh, a criminal investigation in particular, because this judgment was in a civil matter. So um, we, we wait to see whether the NPA uh, will take action. We anticipate that... Um, that, that decision will come down the line from the NPA itself. SAA has folded as a result of years of mismanagement and rampant corruption. I mean, you know, this has resulted in, in, in a really, really terrible situation where right now it's expected that staff will not be paid this month. In your recollection, what, what came out of investigations such as the, the 2010 KPMG forensic reports? I mean, this goes back to the CEO uh, Kaya Ngulu, for example. Uh, also, another investigation that just springs to mind is that 2015 Ernest & Young procurement investigation. I mean, these are, this, this didn't just start under the tenure of Dudu Mieni, and, and she has stipulated that on numerous occasions. Those other investigations, whatever came of them? Nothing much came of the many investigations that have taken place. I mean, the SAA, as in a number of other state-owned companies, there have been investigations, there have been also interventions, uh, turnaround strategies that are put in place, and very little comes of them. They've continued to deteriorate over time, and that's what we've seen. What what happens and and what has happened in in most of those instances is that... um, it's political actors um, in the form of ministers, in some cases, all the way up to the president, um, who've meddled, who have made sure that, um, that, that nothing comes of, of those investigations. It's people who are deployed to the boards of these institutions that uh, um, make sure that nothing comes of, of those in- investigations. And that is partly because um, it's, it's partly um, a function of um, the political system that we have in the country, mm. where a political party like the African National Congress, if it is in power, is able to then determine uh, who it deploys into key strategic positions in institutions such as SOEs. Um, and then they get the backing, the political backing of sometimes, and in most cases what we've seen, a faction of the political party that then ensures that um, in, in giving them that backing, they do their bidding, um, that they do their bidding in the sense that the, institu- I mean, the, the investigations, when they point out uh, wrongdoing, they, when they point to certain people who are members of networks um, of those factions, um, the, the, the people inside the institutions uh, uh, will answer to those factions scupper those investigations or scupper uh, the follow through on those investigations. I think this is what has become um, the norm. We've seen this happen over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is that the political system uh, of our country itself is what has landed us in this mess. Yeah. I mean, I suppose one one has to ask the question, has government failed in playing its oversight role and enforcing good governance practices in the SOEs? Because, you know, SAA is but one of many SOEs? Government has, um, in some, in many of the SOEs, um, like ESCOM, like uh, SAA, um, it's it's failed in its duty, and that's why these SOEs are bankrupt. That's why they are such a drain on the fiscus. I mean, I think uh, think of it as... um, I mean, if you think of the money that has been sunk into SAA, into ESCOM, um, that money in this current crisis moment is money that could have gone into... um, social grants, for example. Mm. And so I think of it as um, essentially taking food out of the people uh, of people who are starving in this moment. And that has happened over a long period of time through uh, a series of governance failures on the part of government, on the part of um, ministers of public enterprises, a succession of ministers of public enterprises as uh, the, the, the representative of government is shareholder, yeah. which is actually a representative of the public as the people whose money um, um, uh, is being used here, whose tax money is being used. And so uh, government has indeed over a long, long period of time um, failed in its duties because, partly because of politics. And, and you know, we, we, look at, we look at Parliament's role in, in holding government officials to account, whether it be the Nkandla issue against uh, uh, former President Jacob Zuma or Batabile Dlamini's conduct at Sasa and many others. And interestingly, all of these cases are brought by civil society. You know, that obviously erodes the public trust against government. And, you know, one, one would honestly want to see someone being held account 
for public funds and, and, uh, and, and, yeah, being held accountable for these funds that have gone. That needs to happen. Parliament, um, I think, again, we've seen a history of a, a progressively weakening parliament. Weakening partly, again, because of uh, the political system, where people who are deployed to parliament answer to the party. And uh, because they answer to the party, uh, decisions um, that, that that are taken and also question, hard questions that should be asked are not asked or where um, wrongdoing is shown. People who are involved in that wrong, wrongdoing are even defended by parliamentarians. And so the parliamentarian's duty to the public uh, itself has not been dispensed with in ways that we should we would have expected. Uh, that this has also um, uh, happened over this weakening, uh, this erosion uh, of parliament um, is something that has uh, uh, been happening uh, gradually, and it, it's put us in a place where people are just not held accountable. The point you make about the erosion of public trust is a critical one. Yeah. Because um, if institutions, and I think the, the, I want to underline that, it's the institutions, but it's also, I mean, in addition to uh, the individual culpability here, institutions are what should uh, be the bulwark uh, against uh, the, the kinds of things that we've seen. And we, we, we place trust in those public institutions. And if trust erodes in those public institutions, in the institutions of the state, mm -hmm. it then opens the, the, the floodgates for even every uh, person in the street to say, why should I follow the rules? Why should I um, not, if I'm stopped for a traffic uh, for infringement, just pay my way out of it, bribe a, a traffic officer? And if if we go down that route, we are on a very slippery slope, yeah, I think yeah. towards um, much more dangerous things, um, where, where, where a social contract that should exist between people who are, hold public power and the people um, um, that they they, 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 they rule um, it begins to be eroded. Indeed. And so um, it, it puts us in a very dangerous um, um, place as, as a society. It puts our democracy in peril. Yeah, certainly does. Uh, Dr. Mbunguseni Botelezi, thanks very much for talking to us. The Executive Director of the Public Affairs Research Institute discussing the role of government's ability or lack thereof in holding public officials to account, apparently leaving the public with no option but to depend on the courts to resolve the matters. Quick break.